So Bethlehem Church, the word is out. The date is set. It's time to come back together. We've said it for weeks now. We can't wait to get to worship together again. Uh, and we're going to get to in two weeks. In fact, we have a small audience that we've brought back in today to worship with us. And, and here in two weeks, there'll be so many more of that. And just as we've walked through this season of COVID in phases, we're walking through our regathering in phases. And so you've gotten the information by now from social media. Last week, we've sent you some things in the mail. Maybe you're watching. Let me tell you what's happening. Uh, we've been one church in hundreds of locations, but starting in two weeks, the weekend of June the 14th, June 13th and 14th, we're going to be one church in one location for a few weeks as we begin our regathering here at our 316 campus, Oconee. 211 and 316 is going to be here for the comeback church together. We're going to celebrate it in a unique way because we're going to have services outside on our football field. Behind our Bethlehem Church campus, we have a school. We have a football field, 51,000 square feet, plenty of space, uh, family-friendly services that are happening. Uh, we're going to have a stage set up, sound system, the whole nine. It'll be Saturday and Sunday. Uh, Family-friendly services, what does that mean? Pastor, mom, dad, kids, bring them all. This is a uh, family event, a time to worship God together, to celebrate coming back, and we're going to do it outside. God's creation is going to be an awesome, awesome time. Bring your lawn chair, bring your camping chair, Bring your blankets. Don't bring your bucket of KFC. That's Stone Mountain. We're not doing that, right? But this is just supposed to be a gathering time to come back and worship together as one family as we regather. So a couple things we're going to ask you to do. Uh, starting today, as soon as this service is over, to pre-register. Our service times are happening on Saturday evening at 7.30 and then 8 o'clock, 9.45 and 11.30. They're happening as well. And we want to pre-register so we can limit the crowd sizes as we begin to regather. And, and once the service fills up, there'll be other service times to choose from. But there'll be plenty of space for distancing. But at the same time, it'll be a celebration as we get back together. So we're expecting... We're excited. Today, as soon as the service is over, you register your family. Say, here's the service we're coming to. The week ends of June the 14th, 21st, and 28th, our regathering services. And then as July comes, we'll begin to regather back on our campuses. Uh, it's been a crazy time. I know you have, but we're looking forward to this unique opportunity to come back together. Now, Here's the question we've been asking over this last season. What does faithful devotion look like in a time of societal disruption? Because we haven't been in a season of interruption. We've been a season of disruption. So what, is faith, what does it look like to faithfully walk with Jesus through a time where everything in our life has been disrupted? And we used the letter of James, Jesus' kid brother, We've used the letter he wrote in the backside of the New Testament. He was pastor in the church in Jerusalem. And the question that we've been asking is, what does it look like to be faithful in a time of societal disruption? And James lays it out beautifully. James is direct. For James, if your faith doesn't direct your choices, then you don't have faith. For James, in his mind, he was a straightforward guy. If your faith doesn't direct specific behaviors in your life than what the book of James, the letter he writes, is he's calling your bluff. And so what I want us to end on, to end this series on, I skip chapter two and I want to come back to it because I want us to end a conversation we need to have because James presses in on the core of the gospel message the core of the gospel at its heart. And it's relevant for us to wrestle with, especially in this cultural moment. And James would contend, I want you to see, it's the way we behave, the way we behave uh, towards one another indicates what we actually believe about the gospel. What do you mean? That you can't separate human relationships from Christian identity. Jesus taught that. And James presses in. But to, before I hop too deep into it, let me ask you a question. Just right there on your couch, living room, 
Maybe you're watching your bedroom, wherever you're at with your family. Let me ask you a question for just a moment. And this is not a right or wrong. This is just preferences. Summer started. This is a question of preferences, okay? When it comes to vacation, I'm asking about your preferences here. When it comes to vacation, are you a condo on the beach person? Are you a cabin in the mountain person? Condo on the beach, come on. Come on, condo on the beach, right? Cabin in the mountain, cabin in the mountain, right? Which person are you? Like, like when it comes to uh, vacation, are you finding a person who finds a good deal on a cruise to go on vacation? Or do you plan a trip to Disney? Which one's your choice? Notice I said a trip to Disney because there's no such thing as a vacation to Disney. There's nothing relaxing about that place. But which one are you? Condo? At the beach, cabin in the mountain. Trip to Disney or a getaway on a cruise? When it comes to pastimes, do you like to fish? Do you like to hunt? Right? Are you tennis or you golf? When it comes to fitness, are you somebody who works on the cardio and runs? Or are you somebody like me who does CrossFit? It's a joke. I run. I don't do CrossFit. I know you couldn't tell. Right? But which one are you? When it comes to social media, are you a Facebook person or are you Instagram? That's usually generationally there. Uh, are you somebody who tw tweets? You have a Twitter account. Some of you are like, I don't know any of those. Or maybe you're crazy and you've been practicing your dance moves on TikTok. Which one are you? We all have different preferences. When it comes to computers, are you a Mac man? Or are you a PC enthusiast? Again, that's kind of generational as well. When it comes to bedtime, are you a late night person or you're an early morning person? Some of you are both late night and early morning. The list could go on and on. There's not a right a wrong answer, but we all have preferences. And here's the argument I want to make just for a second. I would say our preferences aren't just based on our personality. Our preferences have outside influences. We all have preferences. And a lot of times our preferences isn't right or wrong, but there's outside influences. What do you mean? The decade you were born into, the family you were born into, the part of the country you were born into, the friends that you keep with. We all have preferences. All of us do. And there's not right or wrong, but our preferences have influence. I'm a Georgia Bulldog fan. If you've been at Bethlehem Church at long, you know that. Am I a Bulldog fan because God put it in my heart because they're God's team? Or am I a Bulldog fan because I've been born and raised right around Athens as the closest college team and my dad was a Bulldog fan? Which one is it? I'd say both, right? But, but we have influences that make us that form our preferences. Nothing wrong with preferences. But listen, if you follow it on down and push a little more, our preferences begin to become perspectives. And our perspectives are view of reality, the way we see things. We have preferences, things we like, dislike, things we're accustomed to, things we don't. And, but they perform, uh, they kind of inform our perspectives. What do you mean by perspectives? The way we see reality, the way we interpret reality or interpret relationships. And if you keep following it on down, not only were people of preferences and our preferences influence our perspectives, but listen to me, church, our perspectives begin to move into what scripture calls partialities. Partiality, what do you mean? Partiality is more about our default biases, how we gravitate to what we're most comfortable with. Uh, partiality is the politically correct way of saying favoritism. Favoritism. And oftentimes that has to do with outward appearances and not inward realities. But listen, here's where it gets crazy. And here's what we see in our broken world. Preferences and perspectives become partialities. Favoritism becomes part that's formed in this. But in our broken world, before you know it, prejudices begin to be formed. And by prejudices, I mean opinions not based on reason, just per people's opinions not based on reasons that elevates one group of people or one line of thinking and devalues the other or another group. See, it would serve us well to remember that when James wrote this letter into the ancient world, it was a very partial age filled with prejudice and hatred. And lines were drawn between class in ethnicity, and nationality, and religious background. So in the ancient world, when James writes this, Jesus lived in this, and when James writes this, people were permanently categorized. You didn't get to move through different classifications and categories. People were permanently categorized. Think how Paul writes. He says things like, neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, rich or poor, 
Greek or barbarian. There were classifications and categories that you were born in and you stayed in. So in that time, if you were part of the religious ruling class, the Pharisees and Sadducees, you had privileges that slaves or servants didn't. If you were born a wealthy landowner, you had opportunities that a lowly carpenter never would. And Jesus flips all that upside down. That was just the way life was. But here's what James is going to press in. I want you to see this. When the way life is begins to invade the walls and the halls of the church, that the church reflects the culture outside, you have a problem because Jesus came and upended all that. So James is about to press in. See, look at what Jesus, in fact, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is not a lot known, and it's in the Gospels, and Herodians send up this group of people asking Jesus a question. Here's the question they ask him. They say, they sent to their disciples with him along with Herodians saying, listen, they're asking Jesus a question. Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And here's what they say. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you're not swayed by appearances. Now that wasn't an affirmation as much as it was an accusation. What are you saying? Hey, man, there's a lot of people who teach the truth about God, and you're one of them. We're not saying that, or in our opinion, but what's different about you is the way that you don't see through the categories and classifications of people. There's something different about you. In fact, if you're taking notes, if you get your Bethlehem Church app, here's what I want you to write down. When it comes to people, Jesus doesn't deal in classifications. He doesn't deal in categories. You can write either word, whichever one makes more sense to you. Our culture deals in categories and classifications. It does. Our perspectives and our biases. That's not what Jesus deals in. Jesus doesn't have preferences. Jesus doesn't, isn't partial. Jesus doesn't play favorites. And Jesus knows nothing of prejudices. And so if that is true, here's all I want us to think about, because here's where James is going to press for a minute. Followers of Jesus respond accordingly. So if we bear the name of Jesus, then we don't deal in the categories and the classifications that our world is in because you and I in 2020 live in that type of world. Now, here's why I say that. Because if 2020 wasn't already going to be a polarized year with divisions that were really stark just because it's an election year, throw in a global pandemic and all bets are off on the divisions and the polarization that's taking place. Because no longer is it Republican or Democrat who don't talk to each other, they talk through each other. No longer is that what we're dealing in. But now, based on the way you look at this pandemic and the way you've responded, you're put into a category of people. Now, there's people who've been fearful and worried and carried a heaviness, and there's other people who've been frustrated there's people who, who see this as gover, government overreach, and there's other people who go, we haven't taken this seriously enough. All 100,000 people have died from this. They're all over the board. You have people who are serious about wearing masks and people who don't wear masks. And so what we've done now is categorize and line up based on all of these different things. And even in the midst of this global pandemic, in a broken culture, in an election year, we've seen instances of racial injustice even this week again and again begin to raise its head. In our sophistication, in our advancement, here we are still with these racial undertones in our culture. And make no mistake, we do live in a world where there's economic. We live in a culture in America, here in the South, where there's economic classifications. We just don't speak of it much. We act like everybody has the same opportunity if you're born in America. Come on. I mean, come on. James presses in on all this. See, what does it mean to be a church for all people? Because a significant aspect of the work of Jesus was to break down walls that divided humanity. And I think in this cultural climate, listen right here, Bethlehem Church, the greatest witness our church is is that we're a church that breaks down walls. The greatest witness is when we live out the ethic of Jesus, which he was a wall breaker, he was a chain breaker, he didn't see through classifications, he didn't see through categories, and to be a church for all people, what does that look like? It sounds easier than it actually is. In fact, in James 1, we talked through James 1, and I skipped this because this is a beautiful thing. Jesus lays, uh, James lays James 1 and 2 almost simultaneously. He takes two verses in James 1 and connects it to James 2, and I want you to see. If you got one, 
verse 9 and 10, here's what it says, because he's kind of pressing in on this. He goes, let the lowly brother, lowly, or you could write the word poor there, depending on your translation, it may say that. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. I taught chapter one the first three weeks and I skipped those two verses because I wanted to connect it to chapter two because I think it's a beautiful thing. So let me tell you what James just said. Remember, James is writing to Christians, people who bear the name of Christ. This is for the church. And here's what he just said. Leave that up. Here's what he's saying. Jason's translating. A rich Christian should think about his low position. What does that mean? That before God, somebody who is wealthy, a rich Christian, that's what he just said, should think about his low position before God. Somebody who is wealthy, right? The, the comforts they've acquired, the stuff they've accumulated, the things they have achieved before God mean nothing. And the person who is poor or the person who is lowly, they lack success, they have little, they've been given little opportunity compared to others, that's irrelevant before God. What James is saying in this quick little verse is your identity in this world or the classification you feel like you fall in, the category is absolutely irrelevant in God's kingdom. If you're a poor person in all of your life, you've been told you're nothing and you chose to follow Jesus, if you're a poor person, have never had much going for you, you may look at your life and go, dude, I've not gotten the breaks. And you consider you're somebody who's not had much. Here's what James is saying. If that's you, and you've been told all your life you're nothing, when you choose to follow Christ, you dwell on your high position. Because now you're a son and daughter of the king. You're forgiven. You're a joint heir with Christ. But here's what James is saying. If you're a rich person, and all your life you've been told how great you are, and you've boasted and basked in all the opportunities you've been given, you need to be reminded you're a sinner saved by grace. And it's God's gift and has nothing to do with your reputation. Here's what James is saying, and I want you to get this. Our faith, the Christian faith, is the great equalizer of people. And we don't talk about it enough, Bethlehem. The Christian faith is the great equalizer of people. That before God, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, and deserve nothing but judgment. But in Christ, you are more loved than you could ever hope. Our place, our category, our classification in this world is temporary and is always changing. But our identity in Christ is eternal and never changes. And, and, and what James is explaining by using clear, lowly, and rich, what he's saying is what equalizes us, the great Christian faith, is what looks at everybody the same. So look in verse, chapter 2. Here's what he says. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention as to the one who wears the fine clothes and says, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chose those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones, the one who oppress you and the ones who drag you into the court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? So let me give you a picture of what James is painting. It's, I think it's pretty clear, but let's kind of bring it into 2020. And I know it's been a few months, but I want you to track with me. If you can remember the last time you were at your campus, Oconee, 211, 316. Let's say, this is what James is painting for us. Let's say on a Sunday morning, a family drove up in a fairly new SUV. Maybe not brand new, fairly new. Fairly new SUV. And they got out and they had on somewhat designer clothes. By that, I mean they looked apart. The you could tell they, had, they, they were doing okay. And they come bebopping in and they grab a cup of coffee before social distancing. They grab a cup of coffee and they walk on in and, and the usher takes them and sits them on the front row. Cool, man. But let's say you see this happen. Let's say you see a family come in and they, they drive up in a beater. And by a beater, this is not the first car. Uh, they, this car's got a couple of hundred thousand miles on it. And they get out and they don't look the part. 
you can tell they don't know much about what's going on in a church and they haven't been and you can tell they just they've been hit on hard times and they come in and they've never been there and they're trying to navigate and the usher brings them in and he sits them on the back row. And if you saw that, because I know you Bethlehem Church, if you saw that, you know what? You'd be done with this place. Or you'd be done with any place like that. And you should. Because if there's a church where there are walls of class, if there's a place where the walls of classification and category should crumble, it should be in God's house, amongst God's people, when the church is gathered. See, if you saw that, you would say we were making a judgment about people and treating people with partiality based on their outward appearance. And you know what? You'd be exactly right. And I know you know us, and that would never be our heart. I'm just giving you an example. But let me press here. Because even when we aren't the church gathered, and we haven't been gathered in a few weeks now, we are still the church. We've not been no less of the church the last 10 or 12 weeks as we've been apart than we were and we're together. But when we see and relate with people, when you and I individually and in our families, when we see and relate with people based on our preferences, our perspectives, and our partiality, that's almost subconscious how we do it, we relate with, then we're no different. If that's the standard from which we relate with people, our preferences, our perspectives of them, and who we're comfortable with, then how are we any different individually? What do you mean? See, what's easy in this conversation, what James is pressing on, what I want to say is what's easy is to look at a corporate group of people when a group of people labels, when they leave out, or they pass judgment on somebody. It's easy to see that and go, I can't believe that. But you know what? It's not as easy when it's us as individuals because we're blind to it. James is saying judgment is not subtle. A judgment is when you make an assumption about somebody and then you act on it. See, a sinful culture not only allows judgment, a sinful culture encourages judgment. That we elevate one lifestyle, we elevate one group of people, we elevate one way of thinking, and we devalue the other. So what's interesting is we would all, bla when we blatantly see corporate judgment, a group of people, a body of people, label somebody and leave them out, we go, how could it be? And what James is pressing in is goes, but it's way easier to do that individually than it is, and we miss it. We do the same thing individually when we only relate with people on who are like us, right? See, why is it for 2,000 years of the church's history, I don't know how much you know about church's history, why is it for 2,000 years of the church's history, why is it so, the, the Christians for generations, not all, but there's always been a remnant. There's always been a faction that has missed the words of James's teaching on partiality. It was happening then. The way people were categorized on the outside, it was the same way on the inside. And James had called them out on it. James has called them out on it. Why is that? Why have it, I mean, why has it always been difficult for us? Maybe not us, but through generations, the church to miss this sin of partiality and favoritism. And I love what... <laughs> Chuck Colson said, you'll like this line. He says, let me tell you why we're okay with partiality and favoritism. Because we're okay with Jesus' decree to love our neighbors as, as ourselves as long as we get to pick the neighborhood they're from. We're all good. Love your neighbor as yourself as long as you get to pick the neighborhood. We like people who are like us. And James is pressing in saying that's not the way the church operates. We don't live as believers in Jesus. We don't live in the world of partiality and favoritism in the name of preferences and comfortable. God help us. God help us. Here's what James said. If you really, verse 8, fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, the royal law, what does it mean? The one. You shall love your neighbors yourself. You fulfill that, you're doing well. But if you... Show partiality. Treat people differently based on their outward appearance or what you're comfortable with. Look at what he says. You are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but falls in one point has become guilty of it all. Here's what he just said. James is saying we only believe the Bible as much as we practice it. We only believe as much of the Bible as we practice it. 
if we obey to fail. If we obey and fail, the most important word, which is love your neighbor as yourself, we miss out the whole thing. See, listen to me. Listen. The world assigns value by classifying people. The word, the world assigns value by classifying people, and we're inventing new ways every day. In this pandemic, we've invented new ways to classify and categorize people. But the church doesn't assign value. The church speaks and affirms value based on Christ, based on the Imago Day that we are creating the image of God. When the cultural tone of the day, Bethlehem Church, when the cultural tones of the day, invade the walls of the church, then the church has lost its way and missed the point. And what James is saying in chapter 2 is, boy, oh boy, they played the part. They knew the right stories. They affirmed everything that they believed to be true about Jesus. But in their action, they still saw the world through categories and classifications. And they gravitated and invited people in who made them comfortable, who were just like them. So in this unique season, let me give you a couple of challenges right here. In this time of polarization where emotions are high, can I give you two things? And I'm going to borrow from my mom. Because my mom, and I bet my mom's not the only one who said this, but my mom used to say when I would come home after school, and I'd be in, I mean, it'd just been a day in high school, our day in middle school, I'd had a tough day, and I came in wearing the emotion of the day or a chip, right, on my sleeve, right, kind of just chip on my shoulder or my emotions on my sleeve, you know. My mom would say, Jason Britt, you check your attitude at the front door. That's what she'd say all the time. Jason Britt, you check your attitude at the front door. She could say it in a firm way. If things got really crazy and my brother and I went from just coming in with a little bit of an attitude to our words were a little bit what they shouldn't have been, I'm not going to tell you what it was, but let's just say we came in and my brother and I were going back and forth at each other, carrying the tone of school into her home. She wouldn't always, she wouldn't only say, you check your attitude at the front door. You know what else she'd say? You say that again, I'm going to wash your mouth out with, oh, come on. How many of you ever had your mouth washed out with soap? It's a good time, right? That's a good time right there. I want, I want to channel my mom because those are words of wisdom. And I want to say this in our polarized, highly emotional, where all of us are emotionally frayed and tired after this frenzy and all that's been whooped, whipped up in not only this election year, but also in this global pandemic and all that goes with us. I want to say two things to believers because you and I've got to catch this because the way we act towards others is the, is the test of our faith. Here's what I want you to see. You got to check your attitude at the cross. For believers, we have to check our attitude at the cross. And here's the second thing. you got to wash your words with humility. We have to be a people in this season. My mom would say, hey, well, you, you check your attitude at the front door. I'm looking at Bethlehem Church based on James 2, based on how we see people. And we've got to check our attitude at the cross. And we've got to wash our words with humility. If these last few months have been anything, they have tested all of our emotions have been messed with. We felt fear. We felt frustration. We felt uncertainty. And our attitude, you know what our attitude is? We say that word oftentimes. You know what an attitude is? Our emotional perspective in any given situation. He's got an attitude. We're talking about his emotional perspective that he's projecting or her emotional perspective that she's projecting. And I think in this season, our attitude and our words are our greatest witness. What do you mean? At the cross of Christ is where instead of judgment, and I shouldn't even say the word judgment, instead of divine justice, because you and I deserved not just judgment, but divine justice, because you and I are sinners, and we've messed up, and we've screwed up, and we've been selfish, and we've chosen our own way, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And at the cross is where what we deserve was the consequence of our sin, because Christ stepped in, you and I were shown mercy. Philippians 2 says that in that moment at the cross, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but he gave himself up. See, 
If Christianity is the great equalizer of people, it's because of the cross of Jesus Christ. What else does Philippians 2 says? It says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. So when you begin to check your attitude at the cross, that what you and I deserved in the moment was judgment, but what we got was mercy because of the cross. Then listen to me. We also begin to wor- wash our words with humility because humility is what Christ displayed, and we are followers of Christ. If Jesus doesn't deal in classifications, followers of Jesus, we act accordingly. What does that mean? The act of valuing others requires the characteristic of humility. Judgment is the complete opposite of humility because as soon as we judge someone, we elevate ourselves above them and we devalue them. We judge with our words, and our words often reflect our attitude. That's why I'm saying Bethlehem Church, in this hyper-emotional time where there's all type of categories of people, and there's all type of talking heads, and you felt all type of emotions, and, and in this season, this is what I'm saying. You check your attitude at the cross because culture doesn't direct our attitude. And you wash your words with humility because it's at the cross where Christ showed us this picture of humility. And I say that because in two weeks we're also coming back as we close. And as we come back, can I just say this? There's a couple of different categories of people that make up Bethlehem Church as we come back. And so I think checking your attitude at the cross and I think washing our words with humility matters in this season. What do you mean? There's three different types of people as we, as we begin to regather in two weeks. And I don't know which one you fall into, but there's some that are running back. I mean, they're just, they can't wait. In fact, this group would have kept meeting if, if we'd have kept meeting. I mean, they're like, let's go. We're meeting. It's what we're going to do. They would have kept on. They're super excited that we're getting back together. And honestly, if they were 100% honest, they're a tad bit frustrated. And it's okay. You're frustrated at me because I haven't started back earlier. They're just chomping at the bit. They've not worn masks. They've been going about life as it is. They're not saying this isn't a big deal. They're just over it. And they're ready to get back and they're ready to worship. I've met some of them in the community over the last few weeks. Pastor Jason, give me a big hug. And they'd run up and give me a big hug. And as far as they know, I didn't jump in my truck and wash out with hand sanitizer. I promise you. But there's just people who are ready. They're running back. That's one group of people. But there's a set group of people that are walking back. They're ready to get back, but they're cautious. They're not 100% sure where all of this has landed, but they know this COVID-19, this coronavirus has been a real thing. And so they're cautiously optimistic about getting back together. They're super glad we're gathering outdoors because it's open space and there's a lot more room. And the first few weeks is going to help them acclimate back in. Oh, they're excited, but they're not running back. They're walking back. They're excited, but they're cautious. But then there's the group of people that aren't ready yet. Maybe they got family members with underlying conditions. Maybe they're senior adults. Maybe this last season's just been hard. It's been emotionally difficult. They're just not 100% comfortable yet. It's okay. Everything we're doing online, we're still going to be doing online in this season. Here's what I want you to hear from my words. No matter what category you're in in this season, when it comes to just the coronavirus and COVID-19 and your response, here's what I want you to hear. From the running back to the walking back to the I'm not coming back yet, here's what I want you to know. Bethlehem Church loves you. I love you. I'm honored that you would let me be part of your life as your pastor. And I want you to know we 100% affirm and understand how you're feeling. So whether I see you in two weeks, and I so hope I don't, or it's another two months before I see you, here's what I want you to know. You're 100% a part of Bethlehem Church, and we love you. You're 100% a part of who we are, and we are for you, and we're super thankful for you because we don't deal in categories and classifications of people. You're part of Bethlehem Church. See, when we check our attitude at the cross and we wash our words with humility, here's how James ends this whole passage. We're living out this reality. 
Mercy triumphs over judgment. That is the, (laughs) if I could give the marching orders of the church, if I could give you words in this season of hyperpolarization and divisions and categories, mercy triumphs over judgment. At the cross, Christ's mercy triumphed over the judgment that I deserve because of sin. Because of Jesus, mercy triumphs. That's just good to say. Say it with me right where you're at. Right there with your family, just say it with me. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. In our divisions and classifications, we speak as Bethlehem Church, as the people of Jesus, mercy triumphs over judgment. Where everybody else points and condemns, we say the words mercy because we know mercy triumphs over judgment. Against racial inequality and injustices, you know what we say? Mercy triumphs over judgment. In the face of our past and the condemnation that we, many of us, feel we're living in, can I say this to you? Because of Jesus, mercy triumphs over judgment. And some of us in the marital difficulties we're in and the divorce that we've walked through that we can't get past, can I say this to you? Mercy triumphs over judgment. For some of us, because of the prodigal that we have in our life and they've walked away and we're not sure as parents we've screwed up, can I say this to you? Mercy triumphs over judgment. For some of us right now that have been driven crazy and we're at the end and we're going, we're supposed to have faith, but we're anxious and we're not sure and we can't find our confidence and we just are beating ourselves up, mercy triumphs over judgment. Wherever you're at in this season, James 2 reminds us. The kid brother of Jesus who took forever before he was a follower of Jesus, what convinced him was the resurrection. And Jesus in those moments didn't look back at him and go, man, you should have been following me all along. You know what he said? Come on, you're with me. I've changed your life and I'll make you a fisher of men. Why? Mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Will you pray with me? So as we pray, Bethlehem Church, God's timing, I believe, had us in James 2. We're ending the series in Faith Works in the second chapter. We skipped over it and we came back to it. And as we talked just a few moments ago about classifications and categorize, how we categorize people, I want us to end in a prayer moment. But we we recorded this message earlier this week, and I woke up before I left on vacation because we recorded earlier because I'm on vacation. I came back in on Friday and said, I want to add this piece because of what we've seen and the racial divisions and the disparity that we've seen play out again in our culture. And I just wanted us to pray this way. Psalm 68 simply says this. It's what I read this morning. I was like, I knew this was from the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears up our burdens. That's what James is talking about. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We bear each other's burdens. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation. And to the Lord, the Lord belongs to deliverance from death. To bear someone else's burden is the call, is what it means that we are equal in Christ. It's to sympathize with, identify with, and become involved in the person's life so they don't have to face what they're walking through alone. We live in a culture that shifts blame. We're not going to be a church that shifts blame. We're going to be a church that follows Jesus and bears burdens. You're either a blame shifter, point the finger, move away from it, or you're a burden barrier. My challenge for us is to be burden barriers. We live in serious times with so many people walking through so much and so many things swirling in our culture. To watch the events over the last few weeks, which it was, whether it was Ahmad or Barry, or George Floyd, whatever it is, we don't know the whole story on everything, but our heart breaks and we're reminded again. So how do we bear burdens? Here's how I want us to pray. We bear burdens by not thinking we have all the answers. As a white Caucasian pastor, that, 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 that if what we do is, is white Caucasians, just throw our hands up and go, well, we're not racist. It doesn't that solve anything. You're just shifting the blame. You're just going, that doesn't have anything to do with me and my family. That's not how we think instead of bearing the burden. Do you see it? When you make a a little quick social media post to make yourself feel better, that's not burden bearing. It's a subtle way of blame shifting. Not saying it's wrong. Not saying not to do it. I'm saying don't confuse it with bearing somebody's burdens. 
To bear somebody's burdens means we weep when others weep. It means we hurt when others hurt. To bear someone's burdens means I admit I don't understand and I have to ask myself, how can I grow in this area and understand what I've never walked through? How can I help? To burn bear means we want our church to be for all people and we're a diverse church. God's grown us in that. You know what our number one prayer and our senior leadership is? That God would continue to grow our church in diversity so we reflect God's kingdom fully and accurately. Whose burden can I carry? That's what it means. Who can I come alongside? When can I be a voice for those who don't have a voice? How can I better understand? So washing my words with humility means don't act like I fully understand a situation or I really know what's going on when I don't. I wash my words with humility. For the law enforcement community, tragically, a few bad apples that we saw in Minneapolis, somehow we let people stay in a whole community. Law enforcement, our cops in our area, and so many are God-fearing, serving our uh, culture, sacrificial, giving of themselves. We love you. We know, I, listen, I'm in a profession where there's a few bad preachers out there that stains the whole bunch. That's not how we are. We love you and we're for you in this. But I want to say this. You need to check your attitude at the cross, church. That's how we bear other burdens. What do you mean? Well, this is just a I mean, it's tragic, but it's become a Republican issue. It's become a Democrat issue. It's become a Trump thing. It's become a Biden thing. It's become a mainstream media bias. It's become a social media. I love our little social media fake outrage. Grow up. Wake up. What it means is that we do what Jesus taught. and We wash our words with humility. And not speak quickly with sinful words that push the blame. Say it with me. We're burden bearers. We're burden bearers. We're not blame shifters. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So God, that's our prayer. And the racial divisions and the polarization and the categorization and classifications that do exist, that do exist in our culture, we can't put our head in the sand and go, well, it's not my family. That's not how we think. We have to be a people that carry burdens. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The gospel is mercy triumphs over judgment. At the cross, mercy triumphed over judgment. Of my past, mercy triumphed over judgment. Of the racial lines, mercy triumphs over judgment. Of our nationality differences, mercy triumphs over judgment. God, that our church would be people that embody that. I'm thankful that I get to be a part of a people that we're going to carry burdens. And why? Because we follow you and we're the only ones who can. We can handle this. We can bring this on. We can absorb this. Why? Because we're the people of God with the Spirit of God. So God, I pray you heal our land. And you begin that with us. We don't look to shift the blame. We don't look to look the other way. We don't look just to hide our kids from the darkness of the world. But we step out and go, how can we walk alongside people? How can we grow and how can we learn? How can we lend our voice to those who don't have it? Thank you for our law enforcement community that serve us so well. Pray for these families that have lost. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that we would be a people that lift our voice and our voice would not be stained by the culture, but our voice would be washed in humility and our attitude would be checked at the cross. So in the name of Jesus, we pray.